When I released the previous 12 Lies About Reality video, I was really shocked at how positive the reaction was. Whenever I pull people on what would have felt this video they found to be the most meaningful and their general favorite, it always wins out. Since then, I've always wanted to follow up with another video once I got more wisdom, but I felt a bit of pressure to live up to the popular original. For those of you that didn't watch the original, that's okay, you can see this video as a standalone. For some background information, this is a video series that came into being once I read enough history and about the world in general, I realized a lot of things I'd been taught about how the world and human nature worked or were commonly believed just didn't stand up to scrutiny and weren't true. In this video, we're going to talk about what these lies are and show why they're false. I'm also going to have a blurb written at the end of each segment talking about why it's inside people's interests to believe in these things, and a couple books that inform my thinking on the matter. As always, of course, I have my own biases that I can't examine here because I don't know them, but I'm trying my best. Let's dig in and have some fun. Our understanding of reality is difficult to express, but humans have found a variety of ways to present this to others. One of the ways we do this is through art, adding beauty and a unique take on the world we live in. Take Mark Rothko, a leader of the abstract expressionist art movement in the 50s and 60s, pioneered a style of painting called color fields to bring out people's base emotions. People wrote that they actually cried just looking at his works. It may seem difficult to put a price on that feeling, but people have. This Rothko, for instance, sold for over 82 million a few years ago, and it's not just Rothko. Contemporary art has a $1.7 trillion market, one that's been used by billionaires to preserve their wealth for generations. Now you can be part of this market with the revolutionary platform for art investing, Masterworks. Masterworks has so much to offer. Their research team analyzes over 5 million data points to find financially attractive works that they believe will appreciate in value. Masterworks acquires paintings ranging from $1 to $30 million, and since 2020, Masterworks has sold three paintings, with each returning over 30% to investors. While there is a waitlist for investments, you can skip the waitlist by using the link in the description and setting up an account now. Start investing in art today. Number one, people are always inherently self-interested. I guess I'm tentatively living in New York City right now, but I'm originally from small town Pennsylvania. I drove back home for a bit and was just shocked at how nice everyone was for no gain to themselves. For some background, Pennsylvania is a state in the American Northeast, but it's sort of culturally distinct in that it's more conservative, religious, and people are generally friendlier, nicer, and the pace of life is slower than other states in the American Northeast. It's called the Keystone State since it's where the South, Northeast, and Midwest bleed together. This is opposed to the other northeastern states in general, which are an area with a reputation, no offense to my homies and Wittefeltist staff who live there, for being fast cutthroat and people being rude, antisocial, and aggressive. It's something I hadn't really thought about, but my high school best friend was an immigrant from China and we went on a lot of road trips together and he'd just comment on how casually nice rural Americans are. Stuff like us pouring water out the window, driving down the highway, and the cop realizing we were just dumb kids and letting it slide or talking for an hour and a half with your barber or plumber. Alternatively, when I was on the Appalachian Trail, knowing that I, as a hiker, if I ran into any troubles in these local towns, could expect someone to help me out. I feel like smart, intellectual people often like to focus on the rational and negative, to the detriment of the emotional and positive. An argument I often hear, often from libertarians and people on the right, but also from the Richard Dawkins left-wing atheist nerd squad, is that all human behavior is inherently greedy, selfish, and self-interested. To be fair, self-interest is extremely important and by far the biggest driver of human and basically all behavior. However, it can be overemphasized, which can leave us with an unduly negative and depressing view of the human race. A major point to consider here is that nice behavior like the kind I talk about in Pennsylvania is part of a group self-interest. Humans are extremely group-oriented and have evolved to be that way. This is since the groups that could work together well beat and outbred groups that didn't. If you look at people's voting patterns and opinions, they often support their group self-interests, which are directly in opposition to their own as individuals. For example, young men are the demographic that supports wars the most, which they have the highest chance of dying in. Or wealthy liberals often support high taxes. Even if this is a form of indirect self-interest, it doesn't factor in actions that just make no sense even from that perspective. Look at America's truly massive charity effort to keep millions of Europeans alive in the famines that came after the world wars. Alternatively, how every social class in medieval Europe donated large amounts of money towards building cathedrals to show their love of God. 
The modern conservationist movement about helping the environment attracts millions of people who have practically no self-interest attached, just out of love of nature's beauty. If you really want to extrapolate your thinking, you can always find some possible self-interest, but after a certain point, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you use Occam's razor, or that the simplest answer is the most likely, you just have to come to the conclusion that good people really exist. In fact, I think most people without a sense of goodness and transcendence in their lives shrivel up and become depressed and sad. Without the idea that there's something more beautiful and grand than the petty suffering in our lives, we can't stand that petty suffering. In order for society to simply function, most people have to be kind to members of their in-group or tribe. Game theory studies have found that society is divided between three categories. The free riders who always try to cheat, which are about 20% of the population, the saints who are also 20% and are always trying to help others, and the moralists who are 60% and will do what everyone else is doing. In my opinion, the history of morality is largely that societies are structured to give either the good or bad in society more power. In Stalinist Russia, the evil generally won by creating an inefficient system with an evil secret police that encouraged backstabbing and cruelty. Meanwhile, 19th century America, for all its problems, was a society where the good were able to end slavery, expand democracy to a much larger group, institute countless medical and economic reforms, and treat millions of immigrants with relative respect. This is pretty brutal, but I think the reason people like to think everyone is self-interested is so that they can't be expected to be good people. Once you think everyone's always greedy and just doing what's good for them, with the good people just being the most clever hypocrites, it allows you to act that way with no moral judgment attached. Number two, intentions equals results. Okay, so self-interest isn't everything, but it's very easy to do the opposite and act like goodwill is the only important thing. This in turn can create incredible problems when scaled. Giving people who want to do good too much power is how millions of people have died across history. This always becomes a problem when too many people with power agree that they're right and think that opposing their intentions makes other people inherently evil. Across history, religious fanatics have done this a lot, and today the left is by far the group that's most guilty of it. Take the social justice insistence upon defund the police. This comes from a good-meaning leftist outrage that stems from police forces often actually being corrupt and mistreating black ghetto communities often like colonies. In real terms, however, the actual amount of unarmed black men who are shot by the police is statistically very small. The real effects of lessening police influence in black communities and replacing them with social workers who have an extremely bad track record in improving said communities is a skyrocketing rate of black gun deaths, since the vast majority of black people who are killed are by other black people. Statistically, police presence markedly lowers the murder rate, and so defund the police has actually ended up killing far more black people than it saved. We've seen a one-third rise in homicide rates since 2020. The cardinal sin of left-wing philosophy is that it believes that people with good intentions are more important in a macro scale than incentive structures. Left-wingers believe that having the right opinions that brings them to utopia makes them good people rather than actually moral actions, which is why communists have always been willing to kill millions to reach their utopias. For example, left-wingers often think right-wingers are evil since they think the right-wingers are willfully against progress, while the right-wingers often think left-wing policies just don't work. This obsession with intentions has often forced left-wingers into echo chambers, which dislodge them from reality, which has resulted in legitimately evil consequences, caused by people who wish the best. Communism in a 60-year period killed almost as many people as every other religion and ideology combined across the whole of human history. Something really important is that if you sacralize a social group for having good intentions, it will actively attract the most evil and unscrupulous people who will want to use the goodwill as a cover for bad actions. This is why the Catholic Church attracted pedophiles, communist movements the worst tyrants of all time, or religious fanatics have often blatantly broke the tenets of the religions they hold so dear. A great example of incentive structures working in weird ways is that the British Raja in India wanted to lower the snake population, and so gave cash prizes to people who would bring them dead snakes. This in turn resulted in people breeding snakes and killing them in order to bring them to authorities for a cash prize. The British realized this and got rid of the cash prize, which resulted in the snake breeders releasing their snakes into the streets, which just made the problem worse. The key point to consider here is that our brains were designed to deal with small hunter-gatherer communities. People's brains tend to be on a spectrum between logic-thing-based and people-feeling-based. The people-feeling part of our brain tends to be better at in-person, small-scale communications. If your cousin makes a mistake but his intentions are good, you should forgive him. 
However, once you scale to millions of people, you need to view things logically and abstractly. The problem is that when people try to make political decisions to show their morality to become popular inside their own moral structure, whether in Soviet Russia, medieval China, or 16th century Spain, this is my problem with isms, like globalism, capitalism, communism, etc., since when you start treating political positions like religions that demand loyalty, rather than tools to help your nation prosper, you're going to run into this problem eventually. An attachment to this is the cult of authenticity, in which lots of people today basically believe that the way to be true and moral is to be as purely authentic to yourself as possible. And in a lot of ways that's true, or if you try to copy someone else too much, or act in a way that doesn't make you happy, it's going to make you fundamentally miserable and you're going to fail at playing games that other people are naturally more attuned to. At the same time, you need to learn from other people and balance out your own weaknesses. So if you're a nerd, learn to be more charismatic and presentable. If you're a jock, learn to be more wise. Or if you're a goth, don't wear your black makeup into the workforce. Cannibalism is authentic to New Guinean tribes, and I don't think that fundamentally makes it okay. But at the same time, I don't think countries should throw away their individuality and enter into the world's McDonaldization. Number three, we have any idea on the big questions. I do some consulting as a side gig to What If Altist, which brings me into some interesting social circles, and I was once shooting this shit with a crypto cyber defense expert and an AI quantum physics expert about what would happen if hypothetically we had discovered UFO material, how we would determine what it was used for. They kept them looking at the technical angle, and my reply was this. Imagine having a Babylonian try to figure out how a car worked. There are so many natural laws that would separate them from understanding between internal combustion, steel production, but most importantly, the Babylonians didn't even have the concept of natural laws. To them, the world was a series of gods that controlled the rain, their emotions, and the outcome of wars that had to be placated through rituals. I said that the thing that separated us from those aliens would be similar to the Babylonians trying to figure out how our car worked. The modern world likes to believe we're infinitely smarter and wiser than our ancient forebears, but as we've discovered more scientific truths, they bring up more questions. In most scientific fields, we've just slammed into black walls of random chaos that's unpredictable between the subconscious and psychology, string theory and dark matter and physics, or how mutations happen in biology. In a godless world, man builds his pride off his power, which forces us to ignore the things we don't understand. However, if you look back across history, we've consistently found that we've been really, really wrong about how the world works on a regular basis. Just a century ago, we believed that races were discrete biological groups that had wildly different traits, that the universe worked on perfect Newtonian principles like clockwork, that human beings were blank slates with no inherent characteristics, that nations were discrete things that went back to prehistory, that psychology was driven by secretly wanting to sleep with your mother, and women's envy of men's penises, and scientific politics and economics which said the government should centralize everything. All of those were just taken for granted, but turned out wildly wrong, with consequences that killed tens of millions of people. There's this thing called the Fermi Paradox. It postulates that if the universe is so big, why hasn't an alien species evolved to visit the Earth yet, or at least done something we can see? My answer to this is that, in fact, we don't have the answer to this question, means we're probably several unknown unknown natural laws from even being able to get close. We're probably not even asking the right question. When people ask me whether or not God does or doesn't exist, I think he probably simultaneously does and doesn't in some way our puny human brains aren't even close to comprehending. Number four, the underdog is naturally good. I always felt American foreign policy was done a massive disservice by Star Wars being so popular. Let me explain. In Star Wars, they're the underdog good guys who are fighting against the evil massive empire. Now across the world, Americans look for the story trying to find good rebels and evil empires. A good example of this is in South Sudan, in which the American fundamentalist lobby forced the central Sudanese government to recognize the Christian rebels' independence. The result of which was creating a country with absolutely no institutions, which collapsed into a horrifying civil war in a single month, with factions committing genocide and starving their opponents. The rebels becoming oppressors themselves is a pattern repeated too many times to count in the Third World. Another example is that the freed American slaves who formed the Liberia colony in West Africa themselves enslaved the native African population, recreating the southern society they came from in great detail, with the native African population even referring to them as the whites. This comes from a Christian position that respects and loves the meek and downtrodden, but in real terms, suffering and inferiority can allow greater moral understanding and empathy, but 
Also, at the same time, it can create bitterness in repeating the atrocities committed against them. In turn, the position of always treating the downtrodden as morally superior ignores that the successful are often successful for valid reasons. For all its flaws and atrocities, the British Empire was the most developed society in the world on a technological, military, economic, political, and moral basis. The Romans introduced so many advances into the Western European countries they conquered that it's become a literal punchline to a joke. If we treat all successful peoples and groups as villains, what incentive does anyone have to do great things? Number 5. Religion and science are at odds. As I talked about in part 1 of this series, atheists who I have the most profound respect for as a whole often tout their beliefs as scientific, but in reality they normally put out value structures that come from religion and make distinctions as arbitrary and irrational as religions. However, this battle is even more foolish than when you get down to it, science and religion really aren't at odds. In fact, a majority of American scientists are religious. A major driving force here is a misinterpretation of what religion and science are trying to do. Supposed rationalists and religious fundamentalists often get caught up on mythic stories that say stuff like it's clearly impossible that the world was created 6,000 years ago, or that Noah brought all of the world's animals on a single boat. However, all the church fathers like St. Augustine, Gregory of Tours, and the like knew that these stories were allegories. The way religions worked in the classical world was that the general uneducated public was given these magical stories, and the priest classes and the true believers were told the moral truths that these stories represented. Which brings us to the main point. Science is the how and religion is the why. Religions very rarely make metaphysical claims about science as hows. Jesus literally says that the kingdom of heaven is not of this world or plane of existence. Buddhism is a purely psychological journey. Knowing how electricity works doesn't in any way invalidate the spiritual and moral teachings that religions give to us. An interesting distinction Jordan Peterson makes is between reality as it's experienced and reality as it scientifically, empirically exists. In an empirical scientific worldview, life has no meaning. However, in reality as we live it, life clearly has meaning. In an empirical worldview, it doesn't matter if you starve. In our real lives as we live them, it matters a tremendous amount. And before the scientific revolution, people only viewed reality as we experience it with our emotions and our desires and stuff as the only reality. And now with the scientific worldview, we totally ignore reality as we experience it. Religion exists for reality as we experience it. Science exists for reality empirically. It's interesting to see science reach philosophic conclusions similar to religion. I'm not sure how they did it, but a lot of ancient philosophers and prophets seem to have reached accurate conclusions without the scientific method. Look at the pre-Socratic philosophers in Greece who figured out atom theory, evolution, and heliocentrism. There's a fascinating book called The Eye of Shiva by famous French historian Amélie de Liancourt about how Hindu mystics figured out a lot of modern physics in the ancient world. Realistically, if a secretive Abrahamic god were to be operating, it would be through things like an unexplained Big Bang which the universe just came into existence, in which things just randomly jump in and out of existence. We haven't even gotten into all the bizarre possible different dimensions, black holes, or alternate universes open up. EMDR and CBT therapies are literally based on the same principles as Stoicism, and psychologists have found the Buddhist principles of mindfulness are some of the best techniques for happiness out there. Jordan Peterson, again, pulling on Carl Jung, has done a fascinating job of using research-backed modern psychology to look at how ancient traditions are often psychologically true. In the modern world, we often naturally gravitate towards scientism, or the aesthetic appearance of scientific rationality without the actual scientific truthful nature. Take Marxism or Nazism, which were both supposedly rational and scientific, but in fact the science involved was so bad as to make them as irrational as religions. In reality, our supposedly reasonable and rational views are built on a series of false assumptions, which is honestly what I want these videos to be about. 6. You should listen to what people say over what they do. In the Bible, the devil is referred to as a lord of lies, and that evil comes from our ability to rationalize whatever we're doing. When you look across history, our ability to rationalize what we're doing has been horrifically good. Every era of history thought they were doing what was just, no matter how cruel or stupid. As I said in the previous video, Nazi Germany was the best educated nation in the world, and people who perpetuated the Salem Witch Trials the best educated in their hemisphere. There's an interesting book written in the 19th century called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, which looked at when entire nations were whipped up into frenzies over things that those people in their right minds would have realized were completely stupid, such as massive investment schemes that had no clear way of making money, obsession with impossible foreign invasions, witch crazes, or thinking the world was just about to end. 
It always confuses me how people put so much emphasis on how people justify their actions, which I don't really care about. I think the proper study of mankind and society should come from mostly looking at actions without reference to their words. There's no other rational way to do it. I'm always confused when people are judged by the virtuosity of their words rather than the effectiveness of their actions. I hate to keep hating on our friends the wokes, but they're doing so much wrong. Just look at how organizations and people are supposed to make statements of support to social justice, which accomplishes nothing. I find it really depressing and amusing when people say they don't care what others think about them and then literally do everything they can to please their peers. Alternatively, when third world rebels claim moral superiority and that they'll change the system and make it a wealthy, free nation, but then merely fill the shoes of their previous dictatorial governments. Number 7. The subjective doesn't exist and judging is always bad. I once went on a rant on Twitter about how disappointed I was the most common music you hear played at parties is modern mumble rap. Music which is simultaneously slow, depressing, not catchy, has lyrics no one can understand, and no beat. The truth is that most people, if you ask them, don't think that kind of rap is good to party to either. They just want to play what's popular and are scared of going against the convention. When I DJ, for example, I try to put on 2010's pop. 80s oldies or EDM. Hype shit that's catchy that people can dance to. People were really pissed off that I said this, saying that who was I to say one genre is better than the other? My reply was that the world is made up of subjective standards that matter tremendously. Our lives are a series of subjective choices that we can't make scientific studies to analyze which choice is better in most cases. The same choice to elevate purposely worse music is the same mental trajectory that lets people leave trash on the street or pave over beautiful meadows for a parking lot. They're all choices about the aesthetic quality of the culture we share. This is since we can't see the subjective in our culture and in the way we run our culture. Like, is this food good or bad, rather than the objective, like, what's the temperature? However, the subjective rules our lives just as powerfully, if not more powerfully, than the objective. Whether you live in a loving community in the beautiful mountains with an amazing partner and a fulfilling job means the world compared to spending your life in a Hong Kong workhouse lonely and poor. You can rationally tell me Hitler and Santa Claus are at the same moral level, but your actions won't show that. And as the last point showed, reality is shown through action rather than word. However, we fail to realize that when you get rid of subjective standards, you automatically get the worst quality product. Our modern society is terrified of judging anything that's in any way subjective. It's almost like we're scared of human judgment in anything. We create regulations to lower the power of human decision versus society, creating committees. We encourage group identities while discouraging individual responsibility. The legendary German historian Oswald Spengler said civilization switched into decay when the society starts to strangle the individual's sense of judgment and choice and replace it with social collective controls. He feared this process would happen to the West in the 20th century, which it largely started to. One of the common refrains I hear is that if something's not hurting anyone, you have no right to judge it. However, culture is a group project in which we all need to pitch in. If we're not giving it to their honest feedback, we're going to grow weak. When I criticize youth culture and say it actively promotes sociopathy, criminality, laziness, narcissism, and decadence, I always get attacked for being judgmental and not cool, not for saying what I'm saying is factually wrong. I often hear the argument that being a loser is your choice and you should be respected for it, which is not true. Your parents raised you and you're letting down all the investment they put into you. Your ancestors struggled and died to produce you, and you have an innate loyalty to your society which provides for you. Similarly, you have a loyalty to yourself and the person you could be or the abstract concepts like good you can conceive. This is how the vast majority of the world in history has viewed morality, with modern Western atheist societies being the bizarre exceptions. If you choose to discredit all of that, or your family, society, and your potential as an individual or morality, there is something very wrong with you. An attachment to this is people who ignore how the subjective influences the objective. A great example of this is I read a fascinating book that compared India and China's development over time, and found that until 500 BC, both countries were on a very similar trajectory. Then, China became Confucian and Taoist, and India became Hindu and Buddhist, religions that took diametrically opposite views of the world, and then both countries developed down very different political paths because of the religions. And I mean, realistically, so much of this YouTube channel is me just talking about how religion and ideology affects the real world. In the same way that your attitude affects how you live life a tremendous amount, ideologies and religions do the same for society. And since ideas affect how we live our lives so much, you can't make the claim that the world's entirely material. Number 8. Information can be harmful. Nietzsche once said you can judge a man by how much truth he can handle. 
The truth is that the truth is the ultimate arbiter of existence. Having an understanding of how things work is the most important part of doing anything. You can't be hurt by knowing information, since knowing the truth is just knowing what you'd already have to deal with anyway. Knowing that a hurricane is coming your way might lead to short-term stress, but it will allow you to prepare for said hurricane. However, across history and the world today, you see that regimes and ideologies try to shut off the supply of information, saying it will hurt the public. The truth, however, is just that information hurts these regimes and their power. I remember an amusing anecdote of how Catholic authorities in France were burning Bibles during the Reformation for fear that people would, upon reading them, become Protestant, which my reaction is, wouldn't you realize you're the one at fault upon realizing that the appropriate reaction to reading your source material is that you're wrong? When someone tries to hide information, it means that they know they're on the losing side of the argument but want to keep power. This is true between Tokugawa Shogunate Japan, Stalinist Russia, or Inquisition Spain. You can always tell who the bad guys are based off those who vilify the truth and tell you you should support party thinking above it. There's a difference between this and the addiction models that come with modern social media, however. When an already beautiful model with Photoshop and filters makes women feel insecure, they're not getting information, they're getting propaganda of something that isn't real. Similarly, social media apps are designed to be inherently addictive. As an inverse to information, propaganda is inherently harmful. The low degree of trust in societies in the modern world is likely a result of the massive propaganda campaigns of the world wars that all out lied to their populations. Similarly, although I think they're evil, I do understand why authorities want to keep their stories about the world and filter out repeating information, because says stories are how societies work, and by degrading the common myths of societies, you degrade cooperation. However, I think what people should do is edit their stories so that they can fit into new information. And that's difficult, but I think it has to be done. And also, to be truthful, I do draw an exception for very extreme situations. For example, how native peoples often saw the collapses of their social codes upon discovery by the Europeans and realizing that their entire worldview was wrong, and many native societies collapsed into crime and alcoholism for said reasons. Number 9. The world is naturally fair or balanced. All 20 of the tallest mountains in the world are in Asia. Why is that important? because it's indicative of how almost everything in the world is naturally extremely disbalanced and unequal. You can't find a single statistic that isn't horrifically lopsided into certain regions or groups. For example, there are more people in Bangladesh than in Russia. Alternatively, the richest 26 people in the world have more wealth than the bottom half of the world's population. Most statistical sets between social inequality and lobsters, the size of nations across history, or IQs are extremely power law distributed, with the top outliers in the system being ridiculously influential. There's this thing called the Pareto distribution, which finds in so many categories between computer processing chips, inequality in land ownership in Italy, wealth in most industrialized nations, or even stuff as basic as how many papers academic students publish, they find that the top 20% of the population often gets 80% of the output. The belief that the world's naturally fair comes from the human beliefs and fairness which originate in our hunter-gatherer roots, in which things were roughly equal, distributed among a group, sort of like friends or a family today. However, now that we believe that humans are mastered of the universe and our own destinies, we're shocked at how often reality naturally distributes things extremely unfairly. Look at how our ideas of philosophy, architecture, drama, history, and art come from an adult male citizen population of 30,000 in Athens over a 30-year period. Meanwhile, you find many countries that have had millions of inhabitants over thousands of years that you struggle to find a single philosophic, military, political, or technological breakthrough from. Another corollary to this is that we're surprised when bad things happen. When bad things happen, we're often shocked, but really terrible events are the nature of the world. Lots of people were surprised when COVID happened, but in a rational world, we would have applauded that we had a century that had passed since a pandemic, which is absolutely remarkable. To be clear on this point, I'm not saying we should accept the world as unfair. We should strive to make human societies as fair as possible, we have to keep in mind that we're working against the world's natural state. Likewise, statistically, the fairer a society is, the larger it normally works in many different levels through crime, social networks, happiness, and the like. Number 10. There's always someone to blame. In ancient Jewish custom, they would get a goat and cast all the troubles and stresses of the village onto the goat, and then send that goat out in the desert to die. From this came the colorful term for a scapegoat, or the person who has to take the fall if something bad happens, even if it's not their fault. In a lot of ways, this is a reaction to the previous rule and that people want accountability. The perfect example of this is that with blaming statistical disparities upon oppression. 
I know this video hates on social justice a lot, but they deserve it, and it's something most of us can relate to. For example, the wage pay gap, which is blamed upon the patriarchy. However, once you look for hours worked in position, it vanishes. Similarly, women who choose not to have children, in fact, make more money than men do. Another example of this is that people are quick to blame capitalism for poverty in the third world. However, the truth is that poverty is a natural state of man, that 90% of the world's population existed in it 200 years ago. Poverty needs no explanation, wealth does, and that has been generated in great number by capitalism. It's kind of depressing to see with political crises that people naturally look for groups of people to blame. When I say the problems of modern America are caused largely by macroeconomic and macrohistorical problems, people think I'm weird since we like to naturally ascribe human intent to things. It's much more natural to believe it's the left, right, globalist, or elite interests that are destroying the nation, rather than giant impersonal processes. Middlemen minorities like the Jews often normally bear the blame for problems like this. Number 11. Purposely misunderstanding people is okay. One of the things that drives me absolutely insane in debates is when I put a major point across and then the other person just nitpicks a bunch of minor details without touching the core point of the argument. It's depressing to see great men often get torn down for minor things they would have scarcely thought about and not considered for their greatest achievements. Sigmund Freud is mocked for penis envy in the Oedipal complex rather than figuring out the underlying basis of modern psychology and the unconscious. An alternate figure, whether you love him or hate him, is Jordan Peterson, who is criticized for his comments on transgender people while the entire pseudo-religion he is construct based off Jungian psychology is completely ignored. This is since our minds are inherently irrational and if we dislike someone, since it's against our self-interest somehow, we look for reasons no matter how petty to do so, and since we don't want to come to terms with their core beliefs, we purposely misunderstand by nitpicking and trying to cut things in a lot of little ways. This may sound like a minor thing, but it's actually a massive factor in tearing down successful interactions and in people. The way you prevent big things from happening is by heckling them. Look at countries like Italy or Spain, which have ground their economies to standstills with lots of regulations. If you're a teacher, the best way to discourage a student from being brilliant is by cutting them down by grading them too harshly for spelling mistakes. Society is built on cooperation, and we can either structure it to be a negative force for criticism and belittlement, or a positive one for encouragement and positive growth. Negative examples of this include stranger danger systems in which children were encouraged to view all strangers as dangerous, which resulted in a generation of isolated, unsocial, and lonely people. Alternatively, academia's immense insistence upon exactness, which cuts down genius and works of broad scope. We need to structure society with hope rather than fear, growth rather than littleness in mind. Number 12. People are all genetically the same. Oh boy, this one's going to be controversial. The post-World War II world is largely built off the compromise that all people are genetically the same, or at least in the same genetic range. However, this is something that science just can't back up. Let's first look at intelligence, in which most modern studies say that intelligence is between 50 to 80% genetic. When you look at the extremes as well, you would expect a higher degree of genetic fluctuation since society, which we all share, wouldn't be able to produce outliers so great, meaning that the average person is likely genetically incapable of being a genius. Genetics controls basically everything in our lives, with genes that we found result in political alignment, music taste, organizational ability, driving speed, and the like. Of course, genes aren't everything, but we think that they're about half of most personality traits. Meanwhile, one of the strictures of the modern left is that men and women are mentally the same, but scientifically that's not the case. Women have lower fluctuations in IQ, where the average man and woman is equally intelligent, but there are more male geniuses and retards, which definitely holds up with what the historic record shows. A fascinating feminist philosopher named Camille Paglia once said, the reason there's no female Mozart is the reason there's no female Jack the Ripper. Meanwhile, when it comes to race, from all the evidence I've looked at, I don't see evidence for meaningful differences in intelligence dependent upon ethnic group. However, that doesn't mean there aren't objective genetic differences between different groups. The spread of pastoralists around the world was heavily dependent upon their ability to digest milk. Meanwhile, Bantu Africa's immunity to malaria allowed them to populate both tropical Africa and the Americas. The gene that controls for extroversion and risk-taking behavior fluctuates between 0% in East Asian populations to 80% of the natives in the Amazon. Our society is founded upon the idea of the tabula rasa, or that people are blank slates that society can impose whatever they want onto. However, the truth that's emerging is often the opposite, that we're all hardwired to be the beautiful mosaic of the human race that we are. I'd like to make clear that with all these differences, humans of different origins seem to be roughly equal, and even if they weren't, 
I don't see a person's intelligence, height, or whatever you want to measure has much relation to their inherent value as a human being. Hi, what a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Alternatively, I'm launching my Pearl and Pillar communities, and be sure to check those out. I'm doing a Pearl live stream this weekend that's going to be amazing. Also, check out my Patreon, where I've got the first couple hundred pages of my cultural history of America and history of the world. Or my social media. As always, thanks so much for watching, and have a wonderful day.